Hey, welcome to B-Sides Now. Thanks for joining us again. Today we're going to talk to Ian Shelton. Ian is the man behind Regional Justice Center, Military Gun, and a couple other bands you may or may not know of. Uh, I've known Ian for a while now. We've had some really great conversations, and I feel like those conversations I wanted to bring to a wider audience because he's got something to say. Yeah, and I didn't know Ian before this. Uh, Adam is the one who connected us, and so this is my first time chatting with him and learning more about what he does. Uh, I think he has a lot of interesting stuff to say, whether you know his music or not. It doesn't even matter because the stuff we talk about in this interview could be really helpful to your career. You know, it's about taking it slow. We talk about not signing the first deal that ends up in your inbox and, and more. So uh, without further ado, I hope you enjoy our conversation with Ian Sheldon. Uh, Ian, thank you for joining us uh, for B-Sides Now. Um, congratulations, happy release weekend. Week thank you, thank you, feels great. Justice Center record, but that's not all you've been working on in this a pandemic that we've been living in. Um, I know I've heard. Real flyers. <laughs> <laughs> it's still going on. It's still going on. Uh, you know, I've heard the uh, the elusive military gun LP, which is a project that you've kind of launched in the last year, and then on top of that, you decided to do a Void Warship record uh, project with uh, with SWAT, which stands for Sex with a Terrorist. Um, <laughs> Real quick, is that a reference to The Office? No comment. <laughs> dude, bro, look, dude, check out my spot, dude. I got all the fungos right here. This obsession is not a joke. This is—I don't. Just saying, not a game uh, no, for me. no comment. No comment. Okay, okay. This is not a game for me. I'm just letting you know I caught the reference. And you know what? I started a business with an office reference, so I would not have nothing but love for you if that was the truth. So. I think that other people have a when you're creating, you know, like a raw punk record, <laughs> people don't want to know that reference. Like the yeah. whole point is that I was just like, that would be an insane name for a band, especially if you make it an acronym such as SWAT. Uh, okay. And, and uh, right now we're, we're playing with some really offensive names for the LP. So oh, yeah. uh, we're trying to no one no one batted an eye. That was the thing that bum bummed me out about that. Like <laughs> too many people knew the reference and too many people like nobody was like, damn, that's crazy. You know, like and so I was like bummed. I wanted to change the I wanted to change the band name to something way more offensive because nobody cared. And I was like, God damn it. Like That's great. Well, well it's just wild that you like it's a lot of people are sitting around waiting for things and you're just like yeah i'm just gonna keep starting bands even with military gun i feel like when you sent me just the demos for that and we're like yo this is a new thing i'm working on that didn't even make it to band camp yet and now that's been pressed and now you have an lp in the can uh like what why? <laughs> I was gonna say you could just stop right there, like what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then it's like, oh, you know what? Here's the thing. Let me start another project on top of that. And and listen, you know, a lot of people have multiple projects and whatnot, but like, what's the creativity? Is it just getting bored of playing the you know the regional justice style of, of beat down hardcore DB? Like, and then hey, I want to try some military gun. I remember you sent it to me, and I was like. This is like anti-pop punk, right? Is this what the deal is? <laughs> Something like SWAT, where it's intentionally challenging music. You know, how, walk me to the process of the last year or so. Of well, so, I mean, I, I think I've, I've talked about it a handful of times now, but like SWAT was born of an RJC, an ill-fated RJC band practice. And and it ended up being that I was teaching Steph the, the songs for, to go to South by Southwest and, and uh, to then go record our LP after that. And we're just like fucking around. And I started playing this like kind of Greg Ginn like riff. And then we're just like, fuck it. Let's just record a song. Cause I record all the, uh, my demos on my iPhone. And so I'm, I'm capable of recording a full song at any moment, as long as there's instruments present. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to like rock a drum beat. And then I'll, then we just started recording all of it. And then like, I was like, all right, what are we going to sing about? And we just did it in the moment. And, you know, I, 
am really obsessive about like listening to things that I'm demoing. So like a thing that's already completed, like it's kind of done. Like once it, it hits the actual studio version, it's kind of old to me. It's like, I don't really care about it anymore. Now they don't care about it. Cause obviously like, you know, releasing an LP, everything like that feels amazing, but it's like, I just don't ever, I never am satisfied. And I'm always like, Oh yeah. Like, well, I could write a better song now that I've done that. And so it just kind of ends up being that continual process. Like I dropped Steph off at the airport after demoing that song. And I went straight back to the de- practice space and wrote a second song for the band. And then I went back the next day and wrote a third song. And so like, it was that just obsessive process of like trying to figure out something new. And then it just works as like palate cleansers. So like I wrote, regional dirt center and kkk tattoo then i wrote military gun while i was writing the rjc lp then i recorded and then military gun lp and then it just kind of like they all work in one after the other and it's just being obsessed probably with myself i don't fucking know what it is like uh what anybody's process of like being obsessed with creating i guess is like same reason that people have kids is they're like oh i want to see like another version of me that'd be cool you know, and so it's uh, probably douchey, but it's the, I just get you're, obsessed you're, with making stuff. You're admitting your narcissism is what you're saying. If, if it's narcissism, if it's ego, I don't know what it is. I mean, it's I don't know that I would listen to other people's songs as obsessively as I listen to a brand new demo that I just made trying to process what I do or don't like about it. Uh, and I think that that's why everybody creates bands is they want to hear, you know, you're the only person that can create all the elements that you enjoy and on top of that you like it more just because it reflects you and nothing else in the world reflects you besides the things that you make so i mean is it like once and done like okay this is what i created now i'm on to the next thing yeah, yeah definitely. Like, I mean, how do you know when you're done you know like how do you know when the demo's ready to be? i'm first draft i'm ready to rip i guess i just uh so the way that like all the earliest military gun stuff would would be is I would write a drum. I mean, I would write a, a guitar part and then uh, I would be like, okay, I'd have a loose structure idea. And I just record drums, not even really knowing what the full song was. And then I'd go back to the guitar and figure out like what the beat that should like, under that, like would be for the guitar part and then go record. And it just like, it was just an intuitive process. And, and, and that's kind of the way that it, I do everything is I don't really think twice. I dump it out and then I move on. And it's uh, not really a process of like the perfectionism is not in my wheelhouse at all. I'm just literally like, cool. That was cool. All right, cool. Let's, let's go. Let's move on. You know? Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's funny because I think I've, I've grown accustomed to that. Like with directing music videos, we don't have the money to get it right. Honestly, like there's not the money to, 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 be able to stop and say we really need to do this 100 correct you know uh, which maybe means i'm a bad director maybe means uh a lot of different things but it's just that there's not the time there's not the resources there's not i i think now that i have a second military gun lp written um that will be a lot more intense in this process in the coming months of like getting it all completely hammered down in a way that i didn't do before but it's just like I just I just move on. That's all it is. Do you One feel like the pandemic like caught like have has this always been sort of your flow or do you feel like the pandemic maybe like sped things up a little bit so you didn't have as much like downtime? It definitely accelerated my creativity in the fact that like it used to be offset by so many different creative outlets where at the beginning of the pandemic music video directing disappeared. Uh touring disappeared which was like you know, the, my main thing was I was always planning something. Uh, and I, I had been saying for a lot of years in a row, like, all right, this is the year that, you know, we take it. I stay at home for a year, you know, like this is the year. And I've been saying that every year for, for a long time. And then it was forced upon me. And the only way that, you know, I think everyone struggled largely with mental health during that period. But the only way that I was making it through was I was walking seven miles to my practice space. And then I was staying there for a minimum of four hours every day. And then I come back and that uh, I would have lost my fucking mind if I didn't do that, you know? Um, And so that it just, yeah, it really hit the accelerator just because it finally took away my ability to leave which was 
the the big uh, you know the big push forward of my life was always leaving and then uh at the same time you know now that that's gone it was like all right well now i need a new different main thrust of my life so it just became the the writing process i i know too you were also like dealing with trying to get pua and and things of that nature like did that the frustration of that kind of add to it as well like okay i'm broke now i've just got to do what i can do with my time at this point <laughs> yeah. i uh, i mean yeah i mean being broke bring broke to the level that i was when the pandemic hit was the that was insane you know and i think that a lot of people really relate to that and it was like yeah i mean it was ultimately it was like the only thing i can do is be distracted i'm not really somebody who cares a large amount about money but it because i because i've had large amounts of money in my bank account and i've also on a given day i'll be negative 700 dollars or something you know like uh and so seeing that drastic swing of being like, all right, I'm negative 700, but maybe I'll have like, you know, five, 10 grand in my bank account a different time of the year or something. And then it'll be negative again, a different time. Like it just, it, it's a thing that I, tr I try not to stress about. Like the day that I got the, the, um, the fricking, the, the payment, the stimmy, I was, I was like, Literally, I went to go do, I went to do laundry and I had $20 cash. And it was the last $20 I had. And, um, and one of the machines stopped working. It was a $4 machine. And uh, I had to re-put it. I had to go get change and put another $5 in. And I was like, that's a quarter of all of the money that I have left. Like I was like so downtrodden and being like, this is insane this is stupid you know like what am i doing like my life is terrible and then i look and the the there was a a uh, the la times post like if you type in all caps like you'll find out the information about your stimulus check and then i went to literally make a joke about for the rjc twitter i was going to make a joke like oh i should have got this a long time ago because i type in all caps and then uh, i typed it in and it was like oh deposited one hour ago and i looked in my bank account and there it was and i was like shit like literally that came at the last moment it could um wow but you know it's just like money comes and goes and so you try not to let it stress you out and you just focus it's the same thing i'm doing always i'll be broke as fuck but i'll be on tour or i'll be broke as fuck and i'll be writing a record or you know like uh and i was like maybe i'll move into my van it's not something i haven't done before uh, and so if that was what it took to like live out front of the practice space and live in my van, then I was going to do that. Uh, and honestly, what would be a, maybe a preferable lifestyle in some ways for me. So, uh, you know, it's just the way it is. And also to clarify, to talk about the large sums of money in my bank account, that's, I'm talking about music video budgets being deposited. <laughs> I don't have, I don't have huge amounts of money. You don't, just, you don't have just like the plug who just drops it in. Like. Yeah, does it hit me, hit me with 10K real quick. <laughs> oh, I wish man. I had that. I'm hoping someday. Right up. Yeah, if that, someone like that's watching or listening, by all means, like come through. <laughs> yeah, if there's, I, that's the thing is like, I, I know that, you know, um, what was it, Jeff Rickley with the, with what was the what was what was the guy the weird guy that the oh, Mark pharmaceutical Sir, Sir Carol, uh, Sir if there's any martin shirkelly's out there i will be your benefactor let's go let's <laughs> let's let's get this money uh collect hey, records? Speak, let's do it <laughs> yeah it was collect records right was that yeah i just remember and <laughs> yeah nothing got tied up in it yeah. yeah, a couple of bands did. Yeah, that was crazy. Um, luckily, a lot. Uh, I know a few of them that uh, it never like they never made it to the announcement stage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were lucky that like they kind of slid through that as minimally uh, affected as possible. So since this is a business podcast, I'll I'll put my opinion out about about this. Is like I'll take the money and run. I I, uh, <laughs> I I think that that you know these these big entities that intersect with subculture, they stand to benefit almost nothing from us. And so us as musicians or artists or people trying to make something, taking money from them is not to me, doesn't mean shit because I'm like, they're literally stand to gain nothing of my influence about the, in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, <laughs> like obviously there's something to be said about the morality of like, uh, where the money comes from but you know at the end of the day that money's being made and give uh, it to me 
I mean, to, to, to tangent off of that, uh, well, to add on to that, I, I'm going to steal this line from the Axe to Grind podcast and say, friend of the podcast, Andy Rice, um, a, a, we, we would talk about how he was booking in the day of the, the Scion shows. Yeah, know, yeah. Scion festivals. People were so and, mad. Yeah, but... people were so mad. And he's just like, dude, some of my bands saw the biggest payday they've ever seen before. And they're like, what, to hawk a car I'm not even going to buy? I don't care. <laughs> like, yeah, I literally don't know someone that drives a Scion. <laughs> I've never known it's someone more. who drives a sound. Really, it so, work. <laughs> yeah. I, and that was the thing. Like, even as, fuck, how old would I have been? I was like maybe 16 when all that was happening. And that was like when I saw people getting mad and stuff. And I was like, they interviewed Mind Eraser, and Mind Eraser played a joke on them by playing a rival mob song as if it was a Mind Eraser song in the video. Like, it's. <laughs> It's just people dishing out money to hardcore bands that they're not going to see back. Like, that's fucking great. I love it. Yeah. yeah for sure. And the, the festivals and, like, the gigs were always free. Like, that, there was, like, an ethos to that that, like, I could back, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, like, it's not like they're bringing in this they're, – they're, they're tapping into this subculture and exploiting it and charging people fifty dollars to come in it's like it was free <laughs> so yeah. it was like how could you not love like that? literally when i say there was no benefit to it, it there was no there's benefit no at way. all i would love if we flyer we gotta fucking hunt down whoever was in charge of like marketing during whoever's that nephew is that scion. That scion. Oh, now let's do it we'll bring dude i gotta to find that person <laughs> i can walk Imagine like a case study of like how that went down or just like an episode where we can just go through that. Because to me, that was such a like, I mean, I have not seen anything like that ever. You know, like yeah. that. They the really, closest like, would be what Vans does, but it actually makes more sense because their culture intersects with exactly. our culture. It's way more in line. And even then, they still aren't going as far as what Cyan did in terms of like all the different events and things like that. I and remember. personally, I mean, talking about vans too, I mean, I would say that the ethos of the workers that I've intersected with in getting free shoes or whatever, like they're people that I've, am, I'm down for. These are the good people. They're, 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 you know, they work at a big business and they're trying to, um, you know, find cool ways to work with that money, you know? Um, yeah. Same with, I mean, like Santa Cruz skateboards is somebody like that is like giving boards to people within our community, in hardcore community. I know that you have a probably a broader audience than hardcore, but it's like, oh, yeah. um, you know, it, it's, it's, you look at it and you're like, these are just, that's just cool. You know, this just ultimately, I'm just down for it. Let yeah. us not forget, if we're going to track down the Scion guy, we need to track down whoever made the giant Dorito stage at South by Southwest, because that was the biggest. That takes it, yeah, that takes me in a different direction completely, like. This, this could be like, uh, like Dan, Dan Ozzy has his book about uh, the major label swallow up, yeah. like, you, you could be like the, write a book about the corporate, uh, the corporate attempt at uh, the intersection with subculture. I'd read that book. What, what, that podcast episode yeah what's interesting and, and we'll shout out dan ozzy that books up for pre-order now um is it's almost like it went from our band could be your life and like all these small bands that are like worshipped you know the big blacks of the world uh i think sonic use in that book like and then it's like here are all the bands when money got put in front of them but they yeah, were yeah. also part of a subculture and like and that's not the rag on those bands um but it's just that was such a switch in what a decade or so mm -hmm. like it went that quick yeah i just got the 33 and a third for fugazi's in on the kill taker That's which is a, like basically that exact same moment in history where you know majors are throwing around money and there's the influential bands and then there's the bands that make the money and that one, I, I just read the back and I was like, oh, Fugazi charted off of this as an independent artist. Like, that's fucking that's amazing. Great. Like, uh, you, know, you know what? You, you started to kind of talk about labels. So I feel like that's a cool um, something that we wanted to talk to you about a little bit. Like, I know you've put out stuff on your own label and you, you know, you've worked with ver in various degrees of self-releasing stuff. Like, um, I guess I wonder, like, what how do you like what's the right time to like make a jump from doing it on your own or self-releasing or working with your friends label or whatever when's the right time to make that move to signing to something like a run for cover or 
anything really like a, you know when do you what's the right kind of yeah well it's a loaded question right now <laughs> um but uh <laughs> well, see, she, i don't know that like that, no I no 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 i know i know I just, I'll, make, I'll make the joke just to... <laughs> and like the the early rjc stuff small label and now you're on something that's sort of developing into you know i i, I don't put it in quotes to say bigger but obviously a substantial label at the moment in closed casket yeah yeah that's working with a bigger label yeah, yeah, definitely. That's not uh, the on that it's small, and I'm putting that in quotes. But, you know, <laughs> well, I, I mean, within within uh, hardcore, I mean, I think that we're existing within a, a closed casket cultural moment. It's going to be one of these things that, you know, uh, I'm not going to compare it to, to labels that were popular because then maybe that might seem uncool. Because uh, when you look in hindsight, a lot of things like, oh, roll your eyes at. But the... <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, a, a huge part of that is just that nobody was interested. And, uh, you know, I think that at the time when people start being interested and you are capable of knowing if something's the right deal or that you are ready to do that, I think the big thing is knowing, are you willing to tour your ass off? Are you willing to make the most of whatever it is that someone's offering you? Are you you know, is your band going to break up? Is it like, there's so many different things. And so, I mean, I've always had such a, a, a forward drive with everything where, you know, RJC, we had all these labels co-releasing our, our first LP. And, and that was because nobody knew us. Nobody was willing to put up all that money themselves. And, uh, and then from there, you know, we worked with a slightly bigger label and then eventually triple b records comes and and the easy thing with rjc is a lot of the hardcore stuff is just uh handshake deals you know 50 50 net profit split and uh that's it where so there's not a huge commitment there um but i think that you know i've talked about this a lot is that i think a lot of kids over focus on this idea of, of the label taking them to the next level where if you would have looked at what we created with rjc is nobody knew what record label we we're on people probably still you know think we're on triple b or they don't know what label we're on or they think we're on you know whatever and uh you know i would say say fuck the record labels make something for yourself make something with your peers and build something before you enter into a contract and that's, you know, the, the, the point that we're looking at with Military Gun right now, um, where it's this band that's never played a show and, and we've had these interests and we've had, this is the most industry attention I've ever gotten in my fucking life. It's something I've been dying to get forever. And then somehow during the pandemic, it, it happens. And, um, and then, you know, I got to look at that and go, I don't think it's the right time, you know? Uh, despite the fact that the interest is there, uh, do you want to be in a three record deal? Do you want to be doing these things if you don't know the reality of your band? So like, I don't know, it's, it's different for everyone. And largely I think it just has to do with, to are people interested? Cause people weren't interested until recently. Trust me. I sent triple B RLP. I sent, <laughs> you know, uh, all of the labels that I like and admire, um, our first record, nobody wanted it. So, it's it's just about you know it's it, it it's like a it, this is the first time i've been making a decision if something's the right time uh where before it was just the natural progression you know yeah yeah absolutely i feel like there's just a lot of it that, that was really good advice for a lot of young bands who just like they think that to get started on their first move they have to be affiliated with some kind of label or manager or something and it's like no, <laughs> like, no, you're not even a band yet. You know, like you haven't yeah, exactly. been able to go through or weather any kinds of storms. You don't know, you know, what you're doing in 10 years. <laughs> and, and you don't know. Well, and that's the thing is you think about a three record deal. Like, like, I guess this is something important to talk about, which, cause I've recently had to rationalize these thoughts. Your first, like, cause people, I could write three records this year, but <laughs> It doesn't mean those are going to be relevant. It doesn't mean those are going to be good. It doesn't mean those are going to be the records that define my band. Your first three records are your records. Think about how many bands that you even think about their fourth record. Right. So yeah. when you're signing a three record deal, you're signing a career long deal. Yeah. Um, essentially, you know, your relevant years and you're hoping in that three years you are making um, 
a career that you can coast off of the how good those first three records are. You'll be making records the rest of your life. They're never going to be as good, though. Yeah. They're never going to be those records. They're never going to be the defining pieces of your band. You know, not everyone's got it. My voice is who their sixth or seventh album was the one that finally broke through you're right. hoping for your first LP to break through and then you're hoping to keep people with two more mm-hmm. and so uh you know even though like so and also a three record deal you would think at the average label was a minimum of six years because they're yeah. not going to let you do a record every year and so think about what you want to be doing for six years of your life I was in a band called Seattle's New Gods and we signed to a label we had all these internal problems we were fucking melting down I legitimately told the label I was like we're melting down, like terminate our contract. We can't be spending six years together doing this because we're not ready to level up. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's just about that honesty of like, how are you going to protect your investors? And, you know, like in the case of like something like military gun, if people think we're worth money or think that we're worth the interest or whatever, like I want to prove that before I take their money, I want to go out and play shows and say, no, it's true. Or if it falls apart, because it's not the hype isn't real or whatever then that's good that i didn't take any money from anybody yeah and uh i think that you know people are really eager to jump at any of the first opportunities that um that they get and it's really difficult i've done that with rjc where i've just logically gone to the next step and now i'm trying to figure out the chess moves of of being in a band which is a new new step for me uh you know you bring up a good point of like just signing that deal being on having that label sort of carry you do you think that for a lot of bands it's money or do you think it's desperation or not enough bands are because of its money which is the crazy part i think that we are in such a corporate sponsored mindset as a culture now i think this idea of like what instagram has done to everybody's brains is like now what used to be really uncool, which is corporate sponsorship. Now it's like, like there's a, a line in pop star, you know, like if you don't sell out, some people think that nobody asked you to. And, and that's almost the mindset that people have right now where they think if a brand isn't behind them, that they're not worth shit, you know? And I, and I've been telling friends is like the only thing you need a label for is not brand, never brand brand last. I, if, if a brand is something that a label has to offer me, I don't want to sign with them, you know, Um, because then that's association. That's you being tied in with all the other bands that they have, which I think is a bad thing. Um, I think the only thing that they should be able to offer you is money and, you know, partnership in that you, there's someone that you trust their ideas and that you want to listen to them. If a label, somebody you don't want to listen to, you shouldn't be in business with them. And if, um, and, 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 and distribution would be the, the big thing. Those are the three things that you should care about. If, you're, if a label's asking you to put out a record, you just say, okay, well, what do you do for distribution? How much is our budget? What's the recoup? You know, like, because it's the crazy thing. Like, like all of the people that I know that are, want to be on a label are literally never saying it's because of the money. <laughs> like, it's literally because they want that brand to be behind them, which is literally, it's just the wrong reason. Uh, in my opinion, so well, uh, well, when I say like money, I mean like okay, your point like long term, like they they'll make money because that brand is behind them. Not necessarily that. I, I guess the factor is is it desperation? I'm a band. I've been struggling for a minute. Been doing the band camp thing. Never got a physical release. I'm on LP two. Uh, I'm starting to do well in the sort of like DIY small room scene, maybe regionally maybe, you know, as, as a whole, just touring my ass off in the United States, making some waves. Um, and now I'm trying to sell LP two to a bunch of labels. I go to five labels and only one of them is like, yeah, I'm down. Here's the deal though. Is there too much of a desperation of like, well, this is the only label, I guess we got to sign with this. Like is I, I, you know, what else am I going to do instead of going like, you know what, I'm going to, I value what I'm doing and I know I'm on the right track. I'm going to put LP2 again out by myself uh, with, I'm starting to make more money on the front end. I can use that to invest in uh, a very small LP production um, and then hopefully build to a point where I get a better contract in front of me. I get a better deal in front of me. I get a better, as you said, partnership from a label in front of me. 
do you think sometimes that's not thought out and bands are just like, I don't want to work my fucking Domino's job anymore. I'm just going to take this because this is the next thing I need to do. Yeah, I mean, I relate to that, to the thought process completely because I was, I was, I'm broke due to making music, you know? And so, so finally getting a budget, you know, it, it's tempting to say, well, this is the label that's offering me a budget. Like, I want the five grand I invested back. Um, and, you know, it's not always the right move. I think that if you're feeling personal growth in your audience and things like that, then it's something that will only keep growing um, unless somehow you completely stall out and fuck up. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know. It's just if that one label is the label is a label that you're excited about is a label that is providing something to you, then that's amazing. You should go with them. But I, I think that, you know, owning your own stuff and uh, for the, you know, I think there's a time to, to realize the benefit of not owning a record for what you can gain instead. But like in the case of a band like Military Gun, where it's like right now we're prioritizing owning some things because we think that in the long run that will make us money. And so it's, you know, it's just figuring out what your goal is, what you want to prioritize and, you know, if it's the right partnership. Uh, I, I, I am with people self-releasing always. I go broke myself doing it. And so, um, you know, it's just making sure you're in the right place and, and you're, you, it's a chess game, you know? And so if someone's making you sign three records and you don't, and you're any bit hesitant, I don't think you should do it. Yeah. Advice. <laughs> yeah i you know uh kind of to bring it back around to to a little bit on the doing it yourself how has being able to create these records on your phone and not wait to spend five six thousand dollars seven eight thousand dollars in a studio kind of helped that process it it and it like definitely revolutionized the writing process because you know i couldn't do any of this you know like i am learning to sing you know and um and there's auto tune on the iphone and i was using the auto tune to try to figure out exactly what i wanted to do some songs so like there's a song this military gun song called dislocate me i had the auto tune to the wrong key and i would go to the practice space every day and sing it like i swear to god that i'm fucking killing it but it sounds terrible and um and then I realized, I was like, it's in the wrong key. Okay, I fucked up. So I was going and like blowing my voice out every day being oh like, my. I know this song doesn't suck. I need to figure out how to get it right. And, uh, and it was like crushing breaks every day being like, I suck at singing. But oh. the, uh, I would like literally go, to, this is how dramatic I am. Uh, I would go to the practice space, try to do it for a bit be like this fucking sucks i would take a nap on the ground and then i'd wake up and try again so like that that's uh the level of iphone recording that you can get is like you get this auto tune you get to create whatever you want and you and it can help you realize something that you didn't know you were trying to do so uh you know ultimately the, the swat record is the only record i've i've like made on my iphone um but that is that was a, a great step to be like, uh, I just want to give people the tools. I just want people to realize everyone has it in their pocket. Everyone has the GarageBand app. You can make a record that at the very least you could get your friends on board to make music with you through that. And so I, I just back it. I just love it. Yeah. Is, is getting to that point, going back to the label thing, being like, I don't need $50,000 in advance to sign this label or saying, Oh, you want to throw $50,000 at me? Let's think of other things to do with that money in a, in a content based world. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, so money is, is, has been one of my main concerns and, and you try to think about like, all right, well, realistically, what do we need? Cause you know, you don't want to go with the highest bidder cause the highest bidder might be the, the person that's going to fucking run your pockets, but you're like, okay, what do I actually see us selling streaming? Like, what are we, what are we giving back to, to the people investing in this record? And, you know, I direct music videos and a huge part of what I'm trying to do is establish this music video continuity with military gun. And, and so we need budgets for that. And um, you know, and that is a huge thing is I don't think that I, 
because of the demoing process, I know I don't need a month to record a record. I know I need two weeks at most. And, um, and so, you know, you're like, all right, we can cut down this recording cost and put it on music video budgets and we can do other things with that budget than just, uh, you know, just record a record, which I think a lot of people think like, Oh, I could live for three months and make the record or whatever, you know, but, and with that, I mean, my whole thought process has been revolutionized so much in just get seeing my first record offers in being like, Oh, uh, I could afford to take a month off of work and write. And then, you know, spend this amount on recording the record. And so obviously like that's also different creative ways to use a budget and try to make the best record possible. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm actually answering your question at all, but definitely thinking about music videos and content and like that sort of things that I'm thinking about and I'm doing already without any money. So it's the, the goal, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. If you had like a big, like, like pretend you're in a scenario where you have like the dopest record deal ever. And like, w do you feel like you would kind of maybe try out that different approach in terms of when you're working on your stuff? Like, Hey, I got the money. I'm in a great situation. Fuck it. I am going to go to a, a cabin for three months and make a record. Do you think that feels like. Uh, I would do it 100% because it's not, that wouldn't, if, if I had such a length of time, it wouldn't be different than what I do now. Because what I'm doing is, but I, I think the big difference there would be that I would have no time to ingest in influence. And so like right now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm delivering weed. And what all I do all day is I drive around and I listen to music. I, and I'm trying to deep dive old records. I'm trying to find new things. I'm hearing things that are constantly peaking my ear and making me go, Oh, I want to, oh, I want to write a song like that. And, uh, and without that part of the process, I don't know that a, the, a record would turn out as good. Because really all a band like Military Gun is, is me following an, inter an interest on a given day. Like I think that the, the songs can sound very disparate if you didn't have my voice on top of all of them. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if without that ability to live a normal life uh, where you are ingesting music, I don't know that the record would be as good. Yeah. And so like as much as I would love to do that, but I guess the difference would be maybe just taking a three hour walk where I just listen to music or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe. But uh, no, trust me. Yeah, it wouldn't be that different from the way I do, because, you know, during the the early days of the pandemic, I was writing a song every day and I was recording it every day. I was doing vocals every day. I was uh, it was never, you know, and that that would be the process of doing, you know, a five day work week of writing and recording a record. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't. I don't like the process of working with everyone to try to convey a really unshaped idea. Like it makes me feel very incompetent to, to try to be like, I have this idea because a lot of times my ideas sound fucking batshit. I'm telling them we're going to make sway by the Rolling Stones, but it's going to be a military gun song. And they're like, are we? And then, <laughs> and then I make a demo of it and they're like, okay, this is a good song. But to me, it's sway by the Rolling Stones. To them, it just sounds like, yeah, like, like military that. gun. That's funny. <laughs> so your thing out? is Metal Fuck. Blade comes to you, $100,000, we're going to get the RJC uh, Kid A record. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> okay, wait, am I back now? Yeah, yeah you, you froze. Right there. There. Anyway. Anyway, uh, $100,000. It said my internet. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I just um, want to make sure that that's not going to happen again. Yeah, Sorry. you're, you're fine. Good. And we're, we're living in it, baby. This is pandemic time. Um, cool. $100,000 Metal Blade RJC. Are you making the RJC Kid A record? That's what I need to know. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be curious to, I mean, I think that there will be another RJC full length, but you know, it's going to be trying to continue down the path. And, and I mean, this is something I've, I've talked about and maybe I'll eat my words if some motherfucker comes at me with money, but I think that uh, 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 a label like closed casket is all we need. I don't think we need more than that. I, uh, you know, I think a lot of people would be tempted to, to try to make a play for relapse nuclear blast like whatever and it's no diss to those to those labels but to me i'm very concerned about creating 
what's happening now. And I think that what is happening with closed casket is like a building brand new legacy that people will look at the way that they look at those labels. So I want to make my record with Taylor young and I want to release it on closed casket, you know, cause I think that that's the coolest shit. And uh, you know, it's, there's clearly bigger record labels out there, but I think that I would rather stay within a scene of people that I trust. And I know that, you know, we're going to get paid and I know that those various things will be taken care of. And I don't need someone to give me a hundred thousand dollars to make this record. Cause it would be overkill. And that's the thing is I don't ever want to take money that I can't pay back. Um, and that's what another thing, you know, and talking about the time to sign a deal to do all these things is that know what you're, getting yourself into know what you're taking if if you think you're gonna make a hit record take a hundred thousand dollars if you don't think that then you're just in debt that money so don't take it so yeah it can definitely be blinding when you see those kinds of big numbers for the first time in your life and you're like holy shit they want to give us that that means they think we're so great and like they bands tend to not really try to understand what they're talking about and it's like oh no like you have to pay them that (laughs) yeah it's it comes to you first but you have to give it back and if your band is not connecting that's on you you know and it's a crazy risk and people just do it all the time the worst loan you could take out (laughs) yeah exactly and well because it's a loan against your career and (laughs) and and when you take out a loan against your career and you don't and you don't pay it back people go well your career's over you know, like, and that's cool if, if you can, I, and something that I, I, I want to test in, you know, the years down the line, because I don't intend on stopping making music anytime soon is, you know, someone like Mark Kozlik, RIP or whatever you want to say about him. <laughs> uh, he, I mean, that dude was a smart dude. He fucking released those Sun Kill Moon records. He went from 4AD to releasing himself. And then he made hit records on his own fucking record label, you know? And so he was able to take care of his life because he released his records. He's still getting paid regardless of any bad shit that he did. And no one can pull his records off of streaming. No one can do those, those, those things that everyone is seeing happen. And um, I think that that's a model people should look at. I would love to make a very successful record on a big label and then go back to self-releasing Yeah, because it's going to be, less money overall but it's going to be more money in my pocket and that's something that i want to test in you know not maybe not in the next 10 years but at some point in my my life you know i think that i'm going to be building things with partnerships with labels and and people that i trust for a long time now but at some point it's going to be me saying all right for my career for my finances like it's time for me to release my own music again and and roll the dice myself and have less uh of that um you know tighten tighten the purse strings you know you can't spend that 50 buck 50k on a record uh recorded and self-released you know so there are bands under that model currently too i I don't i don't want to air them out you know but they're doing amazing things they're so fucking smart you know, uh, whether it be soul songwriter, soul songwritership and, you know, so that person's getting the publishing and then everyone splits touring evenly. And it's like, there's so many different models that you can yeah. fit into and make sure that you're protected. And that if you're doing all of the songwriting work, you should protect yourself and make sure that you're uh, covered, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you could talk a long time about that. Like bands understanding publishing from a really early, early point is like, Uh, when I work with artists, it's almost one of the first couple of things we talk about when they come in and they're all green and they're like, we want to be on this label. Can you help? Can you help? And it's like, relax first off, you know, Mm -hmm. like be a band first. And then let's talk about these other things like getting you on the road and getting publishing set set up and taken care of and getting it so that when that offer lands in front of you, you understand what those splits mean, you know? Yeah, definitely. So Jamie, Jamie, so do you manage bands as well or or are you just publishing? Okay. I do too many things, my friend. Yeah, I, I relate to you completely. <laughs> she's she's um, a woman for sure. Give me, give me, give me, uh, just because I'm not familiar with your background. I know that, you know, you do publicity for, for some friends and, um, but, you know, like, I guess as me, the uninitiated, like, I know that you're that. And then, so who do you manage? Like, could I, could I get? Uh, yeah, there's an artist that I manage called Barty Strange that uh, low-key 
your production podcast. Let's talk about that later. Uh, okay. But yeah, no, he's a, a great example of just like the, I was just talking to Adam about this yesterday, but just the way he, we've developed from the beginning has been um, really incremental, one little thing at a time. And yeah. It's really focused on build the team first, and then we deal with the label stuff later. And it, I mean, as a case study, it's all working. <laughs> it's yeah. been awesome, but it, it has been slow. It's taken, you know, he had a really successful record in October, but it took I had that record two years earlier, you know, Mm -hmm. we've been working on it for a minute. And so um, a lot of what you're saying resonates with me in the sense that like I, the way I develop artists, whether it's through management or PR is very slow and steady. Like you don't, you know, sure. Sometimes you get that lucky thing that you put out and it just strikes and everyone's paying attention, but like you can't, you can't bet on that happening. You have to take it slow and you have to, Every, you're winning people over one person at a time and if you do it the right way where you're at you know you can be looking back at a few years or even just this one past year of output you've created and like seeing how your own community has grown it's like that's the way it needs to be done <laughs> like yeah definitely well I think that it, to talk about that same thing about having the record two years in advance and then finally it became you know yeah. the hit thing and then then you're building a team you know people don't know this um that julian baker put her record on band camp before it like unmastered on band camp at first you mean the first one right yeah the first one mm-hmm. unmastered on band camp yep. she released that record herself yep and then sent it to six one through and said do you do you want to release this and they said take this down right now yeah. mm-hmm and uh, so th- th- that shows that was a hit record. That is a legitimate hit, re- hit record. That got her on Matador. Um, she put it on Bandcamp and it was crickets. Yep. And then it was rolled out properly and it was teased the right way. It was given to people and it built this big thing. And so, um, you know, in talking about that, you know, that, that's exactly that, that same thing is, you know, all because you release a record, there's so many other things that, that go into it. And there are times that, you know, dropping a record on just Bandcamp and that's fine. It works. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's just so many different ways to, to, to get there and, and to talk about building team. Like, uh, like I said, this is the most music industry I've ever gotten in my life. You know, I think Adam's known me as someone who's like peripherally industry. I'll be able to talk about industry stuff, yeah. but um, you know, like with this RJC record, it's the first time that I registered for um, ASCAP. No, I still haven't done the ASCAP, but I'm going to do, uh, I did the, what's yeah, the you're last 20, baby. You ain't, you ain't having clean clothes. <laughs> what, what the hell is the fucking other one that you get like your yeah. CSXMs? through like uh sound exchange sound yeah. exchange register for sound exchange and shit like that and so you know it's like that like these are brand new things to me and it's and i'm building the first time i've ever had a team and stuff like that and so it's interesting you know hearing it from your perspective as well about because you're on the opposite side i'm on the artist side and you're on yeah. the manager side um but it's it is definitely bands just need to know time and building and something that uh also like i think those moments of instant hype can be super detrimental to the lifespan of a band i would rather slowly build forever Mm -hmm. instead of ever have a moment where suddenly a million new people know who i am yeah i I would rather have a thousand people discover me every month or whatever for the rest of my life over one million in a in in a week you know yeah. Um, just because I think that those, those people, the, the retention rate is so much higher, you know, you're not build, booming and busting. You're instead just building something with people that like trust you as, uh, an artist or a personality. Yeah. I, I think that goes back to a lot of our talk in the other episodes we've done so far is that authenticity, you know, are you yeah, definitely. in for a moment or are you something that someone feels is giving them real art for lack of a better word um, or a real sort of aura in that sense. Um, So, you know, uh, Ian, you're kind of, I'm sure you'll blush and say no on this, but you know, let's, let's let's not forget the regional justice record. Um, (laughs) I'd say in in talking to you, you're kind of uh, for lack of a better term, a figurehead within like kind of the budding scene um you, you're close to the gulch guys you're close to these kind of upcoming bands especially along the west coast 
you know, you've got a lot of good advice. And do you have these conversations? I guess this is two part. Um, one, are you having those sort of same conversations with these younger acts, with these younger bands? Are they seeing like, hey, we watched a lot of people trip over. We're going to kind of make similar, the right moves at the right time, right opportunity. Um, and two, where do you really see the, the smaller scene, niche scene, heavy music, challenging music scene post-COVID with everything I know, I think we're all aware we're going to go into at this point. Yeah. Uh, prepared for the storm at this at this point <laughs> okay so first part i i do have these conversations with people as much as possible i think i sound like a crazy person to them because <laughs> they they don't you know they haven't experienced it yet or or the other thing i get concerned about is it sounds like bragging or something like you gotta be concerned about these industry problems that you're not having yet or some <laughs> shit you know like uh scared him with the boogeyman over here <laughs> like he's coming <laughs> I, mean, I remember i was talking to it is the boogeyman the business yeah, like, not <laughs> not <laughs> not <laughs> not talking about business is a nightmare yeah. um and and not having your business straight could be a yeah. very permanent nightmare uh in that you know you lose the rights to something that you don't realize you're losing the rights to that's something yeah. i mean hopefully i understand modesty is very cool and neat and whatever but i'm hoping to build something that you know if if i die i'm handing it off to my brother i'm handing it off to people to to have revenue you know like to to make money off of like i yeah. that is a that is a goal of, of mine and which means that i need to be smart about every step and so i mean i was thinking about this i, I was talking to uh cheddar from candy the first time i ever met him we talked about owning your records. We talked about what his deal with, with triple B was at the time and, and all of those things. And I try to have the conversations as often as possible. I, I feel like, um, I don't ever get hit up about it, which is interesting. Cause I feel like I do talk about it so much that I would assume I get asked about it more, but I don't really ever get asked about it. Um, I, I'm stepping into a new position where like I'm getting asked to produce records for bands and I'm definitely going to try to take that approach in talking to them about setting stuff up for them and like, you know, stepping in in, in a, somewhat of a managerial perspective just for fun for bands that I believe in. And that's part of what I do with Alternatives Label in talking like we're about to release this Ingrown LP and I think it's going to really pop off. I think it's an amazing record. And so with that, I'm trying to be like, here's the deal. Here's what you need to know. And like... Yeah. They're, they, you know, as, as much as things like, like they, they have things in their music video that I think are going to piss people off. And so I was like, if this is something that you believe in, yeah, piss people off. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's run it. But if it's not something you believe in, know why you're doing it. Is it going to be an unnecessary headache as somebody who's not a stranger to controversy? If I'm causing controversy, it needs to be something that I care about. Um, and it's not going to be something that I'm casually trying to be like an edge lord about it. it's going to be something that i truly like like as ridiculous as the stupid photographer bit is adam knows how passionate i am about that you know like adam has had to be punished by me being like this is ruining what we're doing you know because i believe i believe that yeah. um and so, you know, just trying to advise bands of, you know, those moments to step in controversy, to not step in controversy, what to, 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 to make sure that you're standing by everything you do artistically. And, you know, I, I hope that my friends do feel comfortable approaching me about business. And, and I don't know that much more than they do, but I know I have a lot of fucking opinions. Uh, <laughs> Um, that's all it takes, honestly. I think. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I think that's <laughs> I think that's bad. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. Uh, and as far as post COVID, I mean, I think it's a very interesting time because I think, uh, you know, not to use any sort of loaded words, but I think that th there's a very liberal mindset in the fact that I think people don't want things to return because I think there's some sort of victory against Trump and normality never returning. And so it, it, I'm sure that, you know, uh, as in booking and anything, you know, uh, you experience this, like, yeah, it's not coming back. 
you're like, what? Like, what are you talking about? It is like, like it just is like, that's just, that's a fact of life. Live music will return. The question is when, um, and that answer seems to be getting more clear and clearer by the day now, which is an amazing thing. But you know, it's, I think that there's going to be a split between people that don't actually fucking care that just want to be mad and upset about things because it's a victory for them and the people who actually care about music. And I think that that could either lead to a rebirth. It could, could lead, lead to like some sort of split in this, in the scenes of people that just complain on Twitter and then people that go to shows, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just this, this we're in for a weird fall, I think. Um, because I think there, there's a lot of people that no matter how safe it is, aren't going to say, I don't think so. I don't think it's safe. And uh, those people are not there. They might be the type of people that say that they believe in science or whatever, but are also not. They just like it because of the political um, element of, of not having the activity. So that's my, um, you might want to edit around that. <laughs> Listen, I'm trying to get married in November. Okay. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get my shot. I'm just trying to move forward out of this BS for sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and I'll say, I mean, military gun is a band that's, you know, three fifths back to vaccinated at this point. And I think that a huge portion, you know, I've been booking a, a DIY tour for a military gun for the fall. And occasionally you get hit with these promoters that are like, nah, it's not happening. And you're like, you're a promoter. Like, what do you mean it's not happening? Like, you know what's the easiest thing to do on earth right now? Get a hold for a 100 cap venue because no 100 cap motherfuckers have the mind to ask for a hold. Oh so, <laughs> um, so I'm just literally trying to get people to like get me the holds on the venues, you know? And uh, it's just, I think that a lot of people haven't had this, this thing to point to to say, I know this many people that are vaccinated. Right. And I, in the coming months, they're going to have those numbers growing. They're going to see groups. We're going to see people say, my, my band is 100% vaccinated, which we're almost capable of doing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the more that it opens up, the other thing is like people are like, I, it's, it, it's so botched. Like people don't, you don't know anybody who's been vaccinated. Like, all right, well, do you know a lot of healthcare workers? And then they'll say no. And you're like, oh, well, it makes sense. Why you know, yeah. A lot of people getting fucking vaccinated, you idiot. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I think that in the coming months, there'll be more, more and more groups, families, like different subsections that we see uh, that you're like, oh, they're all vaccinated or, or they're the type of person who doesn't the care. And there's people getting vaccinated this morning. So yeah. March 6th. Okay. Is that Dodgers or where is that? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Riverside going up Stadium Way as I was coming back with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's that's my piece on it is just that people can't point to enough people that they know to feel as though it's real. And so I do understand that hesitance, but it's also by design that they don't know that because it's, yeah. it's literally like, do you have a lot of healthcare workers in your life? No. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like it's been like over the last month, they've seen it go from like the, that kind of first tier of like healthcare workers. And now I'm starting to see like random friends, you know, like random yeah, yeah. left and right are starting to spark out. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Okay. Like this feels like it's getting better. <laughs> like, it's going to, and it's going to start opening up even more than that. You know, it, it's the, it's as the tears go. And, um, you know, yeah. in Seattle, I know that my friends are all capable of being like basically in on by the Seattle timeline, everyone is capable of being vaccinated by April, I believe. Wow. So it's like, um, you know, and now Biden says end of May also just to, just to, t just to throw this in, I hate all politicians. So, uh, <laughs> you know uh, a single one i don't ride i don't ride for bernie i don't ride for fucking trump i don't ride for biden fuck all of them they should all be drawn and quartered but you know so i just want to say because i feel like i sound too npr liberal biden says uh and so i just want to throw that out there fuck no, it's all good it's fuck all, good. all of them <laughs> Listen, they're all saying different things because it's like Biden says May, and now Garcetti's coming out and it's like, yeah, Los Angeles will be good by midsummer, and it's like, what's midsummer? Like, what? That's not even a thing. Yet yeah. I almost didn't get home in time for the podcast because there's a line into the, <laughs> into the park. that line is good. I mean, I was saying back when we didn't know anybody who had been vaccinated, I was like, I'd wait out in a, like an old school. Star Wars, Star Wars prequel line right now for a vaccine. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Like, I'll wait two days in a tent uh, just to get this over with, you know? Um, 
just just to have it done and have people off of my fucking back you know Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's it's i don't know it's interesting it's fuck garcetti fuck newsome fuck them all Yo, what's it gonna cost me? All politicians, that's what you said. <laughs> what's it gonna cost me to have military gun have its first show at my wedding, Ian? That's what I need to know. <laughs> well, the problem is that your that your wedding is uh, seemingly a month after when our first show will be. So. Damn, uh, god damn. Yeah, also, ready? I'm really hopeful of of outdoor shows over summer. Yeah. I don't, I don't see that. I mean, I don't know that I want to do that with my bands. Um, yeah. But if it was the right lineup or something, and things are popping off, like. I'll take it. I would love to to do anything. And, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's an, I don't see it. I mean, the UK, I just feel like so many, I, I feel like I, I'm doing the same thing I do to all my friends right now where like, they're like, I don't know. And then I go, the UK says social distancing is done June 21st. They're having the UK festivals because they're outdoors. Like there's no reason in yeah. summer that things aren't happening to the smallest degree. I mean, uh, what was it? New York just announced April 33% capacity for venues. Wow. So, so in April, New York can have indoor concerts. I mean, Texas is a hundred percent right now. You can go Texas, but that one, people, people don't like that one. (laughs) People don't like that one. Uh, but I think it'll be a really interesting case study to say Florida has been open the whole time. Yeah. 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 You yeah. know, like, like that's what's so interesting about this whole thing is there still has not been any sort of meaningful difference between Florida and California. And we're fucking hyper liberal. Like, we're going to double mask it up, which also I'm just saying this because now I'm just talking shit. <laughs> Clearly wearing two masks is more effective than wearing one. Yeah. That's just clear. Like, people were so outraged. Like, now they're saying two masks. It's like, it's like two, double the protection. How is this hard to understand? What, what makes you more warm? One blanket or two? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like. It, it only works with masks, but you're not supposed to double up with condoms. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Condoms, they cause the friction. They break, right? Yeah, so okay, one mask. Okay, true. That's one- why you wear zero condoms. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. Well, Ian. Thank you for being here. Um, as soon as we get the Scion guy on, we'll, we'll have you back and we'll talk about, we'll ask him how much. Yes. Money, how have it. me back anytime. I mean, as, as you guys know, I, I love talking about business and I, and I just wish that there was better ways to impart it onto people. And, you know, I think that the focus of your guys' podcast seems really cool. And, um, you know, I, I respect that you guys are doing it. So. So you and Ian are friends now. Yes. We, uh, we're Twitter mutuals. <laughs> No but yeah, a lot of uh, what we had discussed is a lot of the conversation that Ian and I kind of have on and off, um, taking it, taking the right deal, taking the right representation, taking, not putting yourself in some sort of thing that may look great when, because you're excited or honestly on a negative note, you're desperate to get signed to a label, signed to a publisher, signed to an agent, whatever that may be. You got to remember that. You're the one in control. You're the one pulling the strings and everybody else is working for you. Yeah. I mean, if you take one thing away from that conversation and from this episode, get yourself a goddamn lawyer, get a lawyer, just get a lawyer. If you're a young band and you have a deal in front of you, get a lawyer. If you're in a situation where you're chasing deals, but you don't know what it means, get a lawyer, get somebody in your, your team and in your orbit who can help guide you. And if you don't want to do that and you just want to jump into a deal, well, I'm not going to feel bad afterwards is all I'm going to say. And and listen, I think one of the reoccurring things that we're going to probably discuss as episodes move forward is taking those proper steps, like starting small, knowing what opportunities to take, knowing what opportunities not to take, you know, this isn't, If you want something short-term and want to try to win the lottery, great. But if you want a career, whatever size that may be, know the steps to do that. And again, know that you're in control of all this. So, you know, hearing that out of Ian, who's someone younger within all this, you know, we're already old and jaded at this point, you know. All right, I'm the old one and jaded. I am young Um, and jaded. But, yeah, I mean... Help me. I think we're gonna have Ian back probably. I think yeah. I think we can learn a lot from Ian, and I'm really glad we got to talk to him a little bit. I feel like he has a lot to share, and he's lived through some of this stuff already, and he's made some mistakes and some had some great successes. So 
Um, shout out to Ian. Thank you for sharing some of that with us uh, on this episode. Yeah. It was really cool. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Or next month. Next year. <laughs> Whatever.